Hello everyone. Uh, today's topic is how to answer difficult questions. And the guest speaker for today is Ms. Mr. Jacob Serian. He is a speaker and ministry director of Life Focus Society. After completing mechanical engineering, he went on to do an MA in Biblical Studies. Uh, he then pursued MDiv in Theology and Apologetics from SIAX, Bengaluru. He has received his Certificate of Theological Studies uh, from Oxford University and was trained in the OCCA, that is the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. Uh, he is married to Mrs. Sitara and they live with their daughter Sasha in Bengaluru. Uh, his main interests lie in the intersection of faith and culture. Through the Culture Unraveled Project, he aims to engage theologically with deeper themes that arise from movies, uh, music, social media trends, and current events. He is also very passionate about understanding Eastern religious thoughts and philosophy. So over to you, Mr. Jacob Chik. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, such a pleasure for me to be here. Um, what I was really struck by was the video. Um, I knew something about uh, Deborah Rising, but I wasn't very sure about it until I saw this video. And it's very interesting uh, how it came about, the inception of it. Uh, thank you, Lata Christi, for inviting me here. Uh, Lata is a good friend of uh, RZIM, I mean, uh, Life Focus Society now, what was RZIM before. And uh, she's always been very helpful to the ministry. We've always been amazed at so many things that she does uh, and all the different areas that she has involved with and how she's been able to pull so many things together. So it's just an honor and a privilege for me to be part of this. Um, and what I'm going to do, the topic that's going to, that's given to me is how to answer difficult questions. And uh, like Beatrice was uh, uh, reading out, um, uh, my, my interest is in culture and engaging with aspects in culture, particularly pop culture, and what are the questions that are emerging from that culture, right? So those are some of the, uh, that is what I'm going to be looking at. Um, so uh, just feel free, I'm not going to, uh, what, um, I'm not going to stop at any time and ask a question, but if you have any question at any point, just feel free to unmute your mics and ask me, uh, and if you have a question, just feel free to ask that. You know, I'm sure somebody else also in the group might be thinking about that uh, particular question. Or it will it will help uh, just in the general way people can absorb information. Right. Uh, so with that, um, let me put on my slides. All right. So this is what I'm going to be looking at. All right. How to answer difficult question? And I want to start off with this first aspect that the human journey can be seen as a quest. The human journey is a move. The human journey is a move to understand, to understand in its deepest sense. You know, uh, civilizations and cultures all over the world have gone on a quest to understand what life is about. You know, uh, what is life? What is the meaning of life? How do we relate with one another? How do we understand one another? How do we engage with the world? How do we understand with the world? So the world itself, the human journey itself, is a journey of asking questions, is a journey of trying to understand the world that why we are here, how we are here, how we need to conduct ourselves. And it always, these questions are always pushing itself on us. But in one way, if I could say, the greatest of human quest, the greatest of human journeys is our search for God, is our questions about God. And ultimately, I believe that all our questions ultimately are theological questions. Those deeper questions of life are always theological. Who am I is also connected with who am I in relation with the divine. Uh, what is this world around also has to do with questions of creation, of God making the world. So whether they are scientific questions or philosophical questions or psychological questions, any of those questions or existential questions, any of those questions has its roots in a theological ground. They are questions about God and our relation to God, our relation to the world in connection to who God is. And so it becomes very important for us not just to answer questions for others and to help others, 
but also to kind of understand how is it that we can answer these questions so that we can understand a deeper dimension of who God is. What are the questions that are emerging in culture? Not so that I can merely answer it for someone else, but through answering it, I will understand the deeper dimension of who God is, who Christ is, how he engages with the world. You know, it's very interesting that uh, the word Israel, you know, has this, uh, the conception of the word Israel, you know, Jacob wrestling with God and the chosen people of God are the ones who wrestle with the questions about them. It is, faith is a journey where we wrestle with these questions. It is not a journey where we are happy with like very flat answers and very confident about our answers. The journey that Christ calls us to is a journey with wrestling with these questions. So there is a two-pronged approach here. And this is a two-pronged approach that I want us to look at when we are looking at this. Firstly, how do answering, how do looking at questions help us understand a deeper dimension of who God is? Secondly, how do we effectively answer questions to others who ask about God? How do we effectively communicate? How do we effectively articulate answers into the world? And in one sense, every religion kind of needs to do that, you know, needs to do apologetic, but particularly the Christian faith. Now, why do I say that? Why is particularly the Christian faith required to be able to articulate the answers for the questions of its time? Because God itself is a God who articulates. Our God is a God who is articulate. You know, in, God's, in John's gospel, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It is God speaks. How speak? New Testament, it is through his son, Jesus. God articulates himself. It isn't that we go in search for God and try to look for God in some mysterious way. It is God reveals himself. God answers us. Uh, in the Old Testament, he answered through the law. He answered through prophet. God is always communicating. God is always speaking. And so if that is the God that we believe in, if we do believe in a God who continuously articulates himself, who continuously speaks, then in one sense, that is who we are. That is who we become, people who articulate those answers, right? And so ingrained in what we say Christology, right? Christology is the theology of Jesus Christ. Ingrained in our Christology, ingrained in the Christian framework is the idea that we are called to articulate. We are called to speak. We are called to be able to clarify the questions of our time. And that's an important proponent of the Christian faith. And what we are saying is that it's a two-pronged approach. In and through articulation, we also move into a deeper dimension of who God is. Understand who Christ is. The more that we wrestle with questions, the more we become stronger in our faith. You know, it's, it, it isn't the, a lot of people say, uh, think that if we really think about it, have these doubts and questions that we would move away from the faith. Well, it's quite the opposite. We are able to draw deeper, in, draw more into God by asking difficult questions and by in thinking about the answer to difficult questions. So in one sense, what it needs to be done is it needs to be encouraged. Tough questions need to be encouraged, uh, whether it's in your church, whether it's in your offices, whether it's with your children. Encourage people to ask tough questions. Because if the Bible is God's word and if Jesus is who he claimed to be, then it will stand up to any type of scrutiny. Right. Secondly, all right. One of the questions that we need to ask is, what is our call as Christians? You know, and an easy evangelical answer sometimes we give is our call as Christians to believe in Jesus and be saved. You know, and so that we can go to heaven. And definitely, that's a very important dimension of faith. But another very important dimension of our faith is what was Abraham called for? Abraham was called to be a blessing to the nations. That in and through him. The world will know who God is. The in and through Israel, in and through his family, the world will know. So Israel is the beacon of light into the world. And so answering the questions of our time is mandatory in one sense for Christian because we've been entrusted by God to be his light into the world. You know, one of the things in a fallen world is what happens is the world is fallen 
and so we are living in a sinful world and in a sinful world the answers to the deep existential question are answered again by fallen human beings not in light of god but in light of the world already it is so the questions are being asked about the meaning of life the purpose of life you know covid human suffering you know all the and a lot of the time the answers that the world gives is again answers in a fallen world in a completely fallen world without the god dimension in it. but we as christians what nt right says is an angled mirror is taking what god says and then reflecting it into this world so to be the image reflectors of god is to be able to look at the who god is you know so we look our, our eyes are fixed on jesus our eyes are fixed on god and then we shine that light into the world we shine that answer into that world you know and it is this idea of being salt and light that we see in the gospel that what is light to do you know people struggle with the darkness of questions you know and i i love the video that was shown in the beginning of it you know what the covid brought about was a sense of deep darkness deep despair with the people struggling with addictions with loneliness uh, struggling through uh, uh, marriage issues and family issues and these are the different uh, what existential questions existential struggles and the call of christ uh, we in our different spheres in this particular ministry the uh, the deborah rising the drm as such is moving pushing light into that darkness and so uh, each one of us in our particular sphere is called to answer these questions and what i want us to move towards is to say there are different ways to articulate the questions that are there in culture and one way in which we think and uh, one way the apologetics has tended to move towards is only verbal articulation okay is articulation through your words so people ask questions and then you articulate through your words but what we see in the christian faith is articulating the answers in an what we say ontological fashion i'm sorry for the jargon but on ontological is basically in being itself we become the answer to the world and so it it is embodied in us and so the question that culture asks we go and we in one sense become the answer how do we do this let me give you an example suppose you are living in a uh, suppose you are in a corporate culture you know and a corporate culture is filled with anxiety you know filled with generally there is a tend towards push towards job promotions you know how can i get the next higher pay check you know how can i move up the corporate ladder those are the type of questions existential questions they are looking into you know there that is their meaning and purpose in life you know how do i rise up you know how do i gain better salary you know how do i become more recognized and so when a christian walks into that sphere he moves away from that anxiety towards a sense of steadfast peace in god peace in christ that he says okay this is my work environment and i will do my best here but i will not let this define me in any way you know i love my family i'm going to spend time with my family you know i'm going to spend time with my friend i'm going to spend time with my church you know and if anything that is there in you know if if i get a uh, higher pay or if i am raised up praise be to god if not praise be to god i am not sucked into that vortex you know i am not sucked into the idols that the corporate culture throws and so what you become is you become the answer to the hopes and longings of the questions that your other colleagues ask you become the answer you embody the answer you embody that hope and whenever in in a place of deep anxiety when a person of peace walks in generally whether we like it or not people do gravitate to that because ultimately our ultimate search is for god the human ultimate search is to understand who god is and how i relate to the divine and so when you when you as a christian walk in with that peace in your heart walk into an anxiety driven environment with peace in your heart and mind and you embody that then people gravitate to that you become the answer to the question that they might not even be asking they might not even be looking for but you in one sense become the answer for it i hope you are all with me in this you know it's very difficult to uh, speak to a screen so i would much rather be speaking to people uh, face to face uh, 
technology has its advantages. We can see where they are, but its disadvantage is the lack of human contact that's there. But I hope, um, I hope and pray that you are able to listen and you are able to hear from the other end of it. So, Lynette, if I get cut off or suddenly go off, just feel free to message me. You know, I might not even know. Uh, so, if I yeah, get... we'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Yeah. All right. Now, one of the things that I was looking at was, uh, or one of the things that we do is engaging with culture. Okay. Now, why I feel this is really important is because in one sense, where do we get the questions from? You know, we as Christians are very quick at giving answers. You know, you know, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way, the truth and the light. You know, but then when you encounter people, all right, they might not even be asking these questions. You know? So in one sense, sometimes we are living in a utopian bubble. You know, we are living in such a Christianese bubble that we are trying to give answers to questions people are not even asking. And so one of our tasks as Christians is not to run away from culture, but to penetrate and look deeply into culture and see what are the questions that people are asking and then be able to give a biblical answer based on that. To be able to engage and give a biblical answer based on the questions that emerge from culture, you know, uh, some of the prominent questions that emerge in our culture, and I know Lata Christine dwells deeply on this, is science and religion, you know, creation, evolution. Those are questions that are strongly emerging from our culture. Identity issues, uh, gender issues, LGBTQ issues, yeah, what race issues, uh, pol political issues, uh, what uh, caste issues, uh, election issues. So these are the different type of cultural questions that emerge. And one of our tasks as Christians is to be able to see how can we look into the questions that are emerging from culture, emerging from uh, the situation that we are in, and how can we give a, an answer that is sound and biblical? And that is one of the things that I deeply look at and deeply passionate about, and in one sense, what I would encourage Christians to do. Um, and so at the end of this uh, talk, at the tail end of this talk, what I will be giving is quickly three methods to do it, you know. How do we particularly engage with the culture, with the culture that around the questions that are there? All right. And if you want, during the QA, you can ask yourself, you know, uh, some of the dominant questions that you are asked within your particular culture. And so it is that. Okay. So culture, the world around us emerges, the questions emerge. They are the ones that ask questions. But in one sense, questions are also being answered from culture itself. But as a Christian who is rooted in the Bible, we know that ultimately all answers come from scripture. It is to be able to take those answers and be able to engage with the world around. Now, I want to give a few examples you know, from the Bible and from the life of Jesus. You know. uh, and what we see in the life of Jesus, why, why this is a mandate that we can follow from scripture, is that Jesus himself has always encountered people where they are at. It's to go to people where they are at. You know, not to pull people where they are passing, but to go to people where they are at and then move them from where they are to where God is. You know, here is the beautiful example of the Samaritan woman. You know. um, okay. And so in this uh, thing, one of the dominant cultural existential questions here is water. You know. uh, it's very difficult for us to perceive water as a very important question unless there is a flood or a drought or something like that. But at that point in time, water is one of the biggest what, existential cultural questions. You know, how do we get water? You know, a woman has to travel such a long distance, carry uh, pails of water and then go back and then kind of repeat it. And so Jesus uses a cultural medium of water, which is very tangible, which they can see, which they are very familiar with, you know, which they're very drawn to, and which is a deep existential question. And then moves the dis discussion from physical water to eternal water, springs of life, eternal water. It is a way in which Jesus has engaged with the questions of his time, is, is engaged with the culture of his life, the cultural question, is to go to where they are at, water, tangible water, what they can touch and feel and see, and then move them from the physical to the metaphysical. Okay. From the kingdom of man, from things that are there in the world, to the kingdom of God. 
And I feel there is a beautiful template for us to follow that we go to people where they are at. We move to people where they are at and then move that from there to where you want them, what the kingdom is. Right? And so you have that example here. Right? Another thing is also to see that one of the things that Jesus does is whenever a person asks a question, he asks a counter question, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, and you see that over and over again, you know, uh, whose coin is this? You know, it's a counter question, you know, um, uh, John the Baptist, you know, was it from God or was it, was it from man? You know, it is to, is to, why does Jesus always ask a counter question? Because asking a counter question helps people open up to their assumptions, open up to, so they, they expect you to give very quick answers. And sometimes like what we see here, it's to trap a Christian, it's to trap us. And one of the ways in which Jesus works around it, right, is to ask a counter question, is to move people. And so when people ask you questions, when you are countered, ask them a counter question. And what that does is suddenly they have to open up to their own assumptions. And this is something that uh, Ravi Zacharias did quite a lot. You know, it was very, uh, very prominent within the apologetic circle. Is to see how can we ask counter questions so that people open up within their own assumptions. All right. So two quick paradigms here from the Samaritan woman and Jesus' encounter with the Pharisee. Firstly, whenever you are engaging with questions people are asking, you know, people within your culture asking, move the question from where they are at all right. Listen to them carefully. See where they are at. Move them from where they are at to a higher dimension, to a higher way of thinking, you know, towards a more metaphysical way of thinking. Move the conversation from where they are at, but you do not start there. You always start with where people are at. That's first. Secondly, when you are faced with difficult questions, all right, when people try and ask you questions, and sometimes it is just to mock. You know, sometimes here you see very clearly the Samaritan woman was a seeker, whereas the Pharisees are not seekers. You know, they are just asking. But Jesus engages with both, okay, with the woman and the Pharisees and the people who are trying to act over smart and things like that. So one is to gauge where people are at, and then if they are not seekers, you know, if they are just trying to answer for the sake of asking, ask a counter question. Ask a counter question in order to engage with them, in order to see where they are at, right? Let me quickly look at these chats. All right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show a video and um, and I just uh, quickly picked it up now because it, it connects to what the mission that you are doing, you know? And I want you to get, I'm, I want this like an example. I'm just showing this as an example of how we as Christians can engage with our wider, wider culture, all right? engage with the questions of our culture and this is from a movie uh, the movie is Gangubai it's a very prominent movie which came out last year and um, I just want to give this as an example of engaging with the questions that emerged during this point in time The movie Gangubai Katyawadi raises some very difficult questions about how we need to view those who are involved in the flesh trade. An important question that emerges from the movie is should all people be treated with dignity regardless of the profession that they are involved in? And if our answer to that is yes, then Gangubai's actions are heroic. What she fights for is the dignity and well-being of the women who are involved in the profession. Most of the women who are sucked into the system have not come there on their own accord. Almost all were forced into it some way or the other. And once they are in it, they become culturally defiled and hence cannot go back to their homes, neither can they go anywhere else. The system becomes their life. We see this in the movie when Gangubai calls her mother years later, she wants nothing to do with her. We also see the other women who write to their parents asking for forgiveness but know that they might not receive any because of the deep stigma attached to what they have done. What the movie shows is that if we approach the problem purely from a highbrow moralistic stance, we will fail to see their experience and empathize with their situation. It isn't about compromising on what is right, but it is about seeing them as human beings who have gone through very unfortunate events in life to land where they have. 
the movie pushes us to see the nuances of their situation and why they merit more dignity than what society offers them. There is a story in the gospel that can help give us a certain perspective. In John 8, we see a woman caught in adultery brought to the temple and the crowd about to stone her. Jesus tells the crowd that those who have sinned should cast the first stone. And slowly the crowd disappears until there's no one left to condemn her. What is interesting about the incident is that the man who she commits adultery with is not brought there. She obviously didn't do it with herself. So there is a lopsidedness to the law that Christ recognizes. After the crowd leaves, Jesus asks her, has anyone condemned you? And she says, no. Christ says, neither do I condemn you. It isn't that Jesus is giving a thumbs up for her actions, but it is an offer of forgiveness and a chance to change. To those who were ready to stone her, it was a chance for them to look into their hearts and see that they were no better than her. It is true that sometimes in the hierarchy of wrongdoings, we put sexual misconduct above everything else and those involved in it as the worst. But what Christ calls us to do is to reframe those assumptions, to look at people regardless of what they do as human beings deserving of dignity and forgiveness. It is an offer of hope and restoration rather than condescension and condemnation. And so, and that's an example of what we try and do with Culture Unravel, it's a project we are like focused on, is that here is one of the questions that are emerging from culture, and particularly this movie that Sanjay Lila Bansali has a way of kind of doing visuals and getting the conversation going on a very difficult topic. You know, the topic is prostitution, the topic is a flesh trade, and the way in which people in that industry are completely what culturally defiled uh, uh, and they are looked down upon, you know, by the very men who kind of engage in this act. You know, here is a cultural issue, you know, and it's a dominant cultural issue that's there. You know, um, it, it uh, dominant for the questions about lust, questions about how we view the other, questions about the flesh trade, questions about uh, women who are kind of engaged with it, uh, quel uh, questions about the whole systemic issue. Now, here is a system. All right, that's going on. Those are some of the questions that emerge from our culture, emerge from these movies and become talking points uh, for, by different people. And what we bring in, what we as, able, as Christians are able to bring in is a counter perspective in and through the life of Christ. And here I felt like the woman caught in adultery seamlessly speaks into these cultural questions that people are asking. You know, how did Jesus view this woman caught in adultery and how did he engage with her? And in, in, in kind of putting it in light with this event, you know, with this movie, with what Gangubai is doing, you're also able to see what you're able to create that kind of a dialogue. So here is a question and here is an answer that emerges. Here is a, is a, is a embodied life of Christ and how he engaged with asking questions. All right. And so, um, and so here we have, here we have the, uh, this is the template that I want to look at. All right. Not able to. All right. And so here is the template that we look at. Right. Firstly, whenever cultural issues emerge, one of the tasks that we do as Christians is to identify the heart of that question. You know, what is the heart of that question? What is it really getting at? What is culture really getting at? And we need to really be able to see through that. You know, one of the things that they say is this whole sexuality issue, LGBTQ issue can identify you. Look at it. Well, you know, it's it's so many problems. You know, the, the heart of the question, the heart of the issue is a lesbian, gay, transgender. There's this one theologian who says, no, the, ultimately the question is identity. When people cut their identity in who they are in God, children of God, then they have to find their identity in something else sexuality becomes a way for them to find their identity. And so it is to, as Christian, one of the things that we need to do is when questions of culture emerge or when people are asking questions, we need to find what is the heart of that question. You know, I had a conversation in person who was so angry with God, so angry with evil and suffering you know, in the world. And he's talking about it and he's talking about it from a very high metaphysical uh, angle, bringing in Kant, in bringing in Nietzsche, in, and he's, he's throwing all this in. Finally, by the way in which he's asking this question, I said, did something happen to you? 
and he says yes his sister died and died in a very tragic death and so that is the heart of what he's actually asking that is the heart of his question the heart of his question is his what happened with his sister and so culture will always first is to identify the heart of the question you know there's a greek thing of uh, you know, a dragon with many heads and you could cut off the different heads but then again two heads grow and then you cut off that head two heads grow but the way to kill that dragon is to find the heart and to pierce it and that's the answer whenever questions emerge from culture you need to find out what is the heart of that question and then pierce it secondly find the answer in god find the answer in scripture find the answer in god's word um like in this gangubai's case you, you see that answer very clearly in scripture and then you bring that answer the world always throws different answers at us you know uh, if you look at one of the major cultural issues is uh, is how people uh, what look at skin fair being fair skin and the answer is the answer culture throws is this cream and that cream to make a person more fair or more beautiful you know but the answer in god is to say no change your perception of beauty god has made people beautiful and so you engage with that you know beauty as as much deeper than anything physical that is there find the beauty that is there within you know and so here is a particular cultural issue of how people perceive beauty and the answer culture throws is uh, a different type of cosmetics but the answer in god is to understand the beauty that lies way beyond you know, slight uh, lay deep within and to be able to bring that up and finally articulate that answer find ways to articulate that answer however it is you know here you have by starting a movement that is the answer that is the way in which you articulate the answer of god have a helpline service uh, for people who are struggling you know one of the things that we do in culture unravel is to bring out uh, through what through youtube videos through podcast through blog through talks through training programs you know help articulate that there are many ways by which you can articulate that answer find your way whether it's a painting or whether it's being a diligent worker or whether it's counseling or whether it's talking find different find your way of how you can articulate that answer whatever gifting god has given you find a way to articulate that answer into the world all right and so these are the ways by which you can engage with the questions of culture firstly identify ultimately the symptom has to be something there identify that secondly find the answer in god and finally articulate that answer back into the world and so these are some ways by which you can engage with the culture engage with the world around so let me quickly pray and then i will i, I will give it back to the mc in order to open it up on any questions let me pray. loving heavenly father we say lord we thank you lord for this group who has set aside a, a a friday evening to come and to uh, listen and to learn and to engage we pray lord that this meaningful that we as christians would be able to answer questions of our culture embody that answer as you have embodied as we saw in the case of the samaritan women and the pharisees be able to uh, look at the questions that are there in culture and be able to speak to be able to articulate ask count the questions to be able to identify the heart of the problem then we pray lord that you have put each one of us in different situations different circumstances in different places and we pray lord that we will be able to shine your light be salt and light and be a blessing to our communities in jesus name amen uh, thank you so much um, mr jacob for sharing your insights uh, now the question answer session will be taken over by miss christina thank you thank you so much and thank you so much for that insightful and uh, in a way like i think thought provoking conversation on asking questions and uh, to speak with truth and grace we have a couple of questions in the chat box uh, we'll start off with that we have a question from mr pb dureraj i will summarize that so his question is what is the extent of involvement that we have to have as christians in the society especially how to be a light in such scenarios where we see a lot of uh, extremism we see a lot of uh, protest we see there's so many examples and he has given specific examples including uh, the things that are happening in our nation right now 
including some of the churches and uh, the people at farms, farmers and others that are protesting. So, uh, so over to you to answer that, however you feel yeah, is appropriate. Thank you. That's an excellent question. You know, what is the level at which we should engage with our culture? You know, for what, especially when we see extreme forms of what crime and uh, uh, what uh, larger political issues and governance issues and persecution. What is the extent to which we need to engage? I want to start off with this. You know, firstly to understand that it is never easy to engage with culture. There's always a cost. You know, so we don't tread on this lightly. Right. We don't tread on when we enter into a space, a dark space, we, know, we don't tread on it overconfidently or we don't tread on it lightly. We understand, yes, this is a calling that God might have been put on us, but it's a calling which comes with responsibility. It's a calling that comes with deep discipline in our own hearts. And one way to minimize the risk is to do it as a community, do it as a body of believers, you know, do it with other Christians. The greatest answer to the upheavals, cultural upheavals, is not politics or governance. It is the church. Why is it the church? Because the church is a group of people who give their allegiance not to the government or state to it or any other political ideology, but to Jesus Christ. And through that, we are then able to go into culture and then be able to speak into culture. So firstly, to, to say that it is not, we should never take it lightly. But secondly, is to say that we, there is no other, the way to be a Christian is not to go up into a mountain or into a valley and then cut ourselves from the world and just be there. You know, That is not the Christian life God has called us. The fact is, God could have placed us anywhere in the world at any point in time. You know, we could have been born in second century in, uh, in Middle East or in the 18th century in Europe. But the fact is, we are born here in the 21st century in India, in this time and space dimension. And we have to say that, we have to accept that that's not an accident. God didn't put us here out of uh, accident. We are just suddenly born here. If we are put within this cultural space for this time and reason, then there is a purpose behind it. And that purpose is to engage with that particular culture. The difficulties that are there for our time. And every time there are difficulties. In our time, this is our difficulty. And God will never call us to do something much greater than what we can handle. Right? And so we need to say, what has God called us for? You know, uh, of course, there's larger persecution issues and there are certain lawyers that I know who are fighting it at, in, the, in terms of government, in terms of what the constitution can provide. Now, am I called to fight for that? No, I'm not. I don't have the skills. I don't have the expertise. And it's too much for me to think that that is my calling. My calling could be in a much much more smaller way, in a different way, you know, um, it, it, in my organization, in my family, in my church. And so it's to always understand what is the circle that God has called us? What is that cultural circle? And that's all that God expects us to act from that. Not to go much greater, not to go much lesser than that. To stand our sacred ground and to fight that particular thing. I hope that's helpful. That would be what I would say. Sure. Yeah, I think um, I, I will bounce off a question of that a bit later, but we do have another question. So I'll, we'll get to that. And I think they posted it in the common uh, group. It's from Ms. Sasikala, Sister Sasikala. Uh, so I think her question is about how do we explain to people, especially even children or non-Christians, the, the pain of the innocent and uh, how to be able to explain to them the presence of a God and, and also in terms of non-Christians who are really good, who do a lot of good things to explain to them that, you know, perhaps that they, they don't, the salvation is not yet uh, something that they have gone into. All right. Um, let me answer the first part of it, you know. Uh, so the question is that um, uh, particularly in terms of suffering, right, that is there in the world, why innocent people? Are killed you know why are they targeted that's there you know and that's a very that's an important issue that's a common issue why would god allow that well here very clearly we have the biblical answer for it right in genesis the biblical answer is that in genesis the world god created was a good world the world that god created god did not create a fallen world god did not create a world of suffering and where innocent people have to die what god created was a good world 
But in order for this good world to be truly free, then God has to give human beings the opportunity to act freely, to act freely in the world. And what we see encapsulated in the Genesis account is human beings are going to use that freedom not to follow God, but to follow their own type of thing, you know, to, to cut the God out of it and to be God themselves. You know, it is to uh, live life for their own terms, on their own freedom. And, and because of that, we see these kind of results that is there in the world. Innocent people, like war and crime and all these different things. They are a product of a fallen world. So the, the reason for that is not God. The reason for that is human being using that freedom not to follow God, but to follow the world. All right. And so we will always see that in the fallen world. But the question is, where is God in and through all of this fallenness? You know, where, why isn't God acting? And the Christian answer is, yes, God is always acting in and through the situation. You know, there's this amazing movie I've I forgot the name of this movie. Basically, it is, a, it is a debate that sparks off between certain Jews who are caught up in a concentration camp. You know, they are about to be executed. They are about to die. And they are all caught up in a concentration camp. And suddenly they burst into a debate with one group saying that God has ultimately abandoned us. You know, if Jesus, you know, if Yahweh is a God who has revealed himself to the Israelites, to the Jews, how is it that they have come to a point where the Germans are then now executing them, not mass genocide, killing them, you know, killing a complete race. And so the answer is ultimately God has abandoned them. There's a debate that sparks off. There's one older person there who says, no, I know where God is. He says, God is right here in this concentration camp here suffering with us. He is with us here taking that suffering with us. And what we see on the cross, what we see the God revealed in Jesus Christ is that a God who is not escaping the suffering that is there with the world, but comes deep into our suffering and suffers with us. And in that process liberates us. It isn't to escape, make us escape. We have to, there are consequences for actions, you know. And so in a free world, we have to follow the consequences for those actions. But the answer is that God is there with us. He is suffering with us. He is there with us. Whoever turns to him receives forgiveness, not just for the person who is being a, a victim of that crime, but even the perpetrator of that crime. So firstly, uh, God made this world and this world is a good world. Human choice is the result of a fallen world. The fallen world is a result of human choice. So that's the first thing that we can tell your children. Secondly, God is always there with us. He's always there suffering with us. And that is the God that is revealed in Jesus. Thank you. And I think you've answered another question that was asked in the chat. Uh, so we'll get back to the other question from uh, Mr. Durairaj. But meanwhile, if anyone else wants to unmute, you can also unmute yourself and ask him a question. We have about 10 more minutes. Yeah, Jacob, I have one question. Um, hello, can yes. you hear me? Yes, I can hear, we can hear you. Yeah, so uh, this we we say that we should be part of the culture and we share and uh, proclaim the love of Christ. So in that way, what I, my question is, say Carnatic music and Indian classical dance, many times avoid um, thinking that it's part of some other culture. Um, so what do you answer for that? Should we also um, can um, express the love of Christ through Indian classical dance and through Carnatic music and through everything which is of Indian culture. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, thanks for asking that. Uh, it's an important question to even think of. And I know you're driving, so please be careful <laughs> as you're driving there. Um, no, it's one, my, my son is driving. I'm sitting. Oh, your son is driving. Okay, okay, okay. Fine. Fine. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Um, See, one of the problems, I just want to take this, uh, it's a very important question for us to think of. And the, th the thing is, the more different Christians will have different answers for it. All right. So I'm just giving an answer that I believe, but it's not God's word or anything. It's just a perspective that I would, uh, so you can take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, what I believe is the problem with Christianity, as we see in India today, is that 
Christianity came in the vehicle of colonialism. So colonialism is vital through which Christian. And one of the one of the aspects of colonialism is to look at everything that is there within a particular culture as disdain and think that we are the bringers of a very different, like Christian culture, into that. So they look at their, they look at anything else with the type of cultural superiority and everything else as evil that is there, you know. And it isn't Christianity exactly because Christianity has been able to adapt to different aspects. You know, if you look at Christianity in Ireland or if you look at Christianity in Kerala, that came much before, you know, with uh, uh, with Thomas and things like that. That's a very different history that's there. Or you look at Christianity anywhere else in different parts of the world, they have been able to assimilate the things that are there in culture and renew it and reframe it, you know. The piano was particularly played in pubs and bars and Christianity reclaimed it and made it as an instrument that greatly glorified God. So Christianity is able to move into different cultural forms and be able to renew it, be able to redeem it for the glory of God. And so we should not be ashamed or we should not be uh, what uh, or should not move away from our uh, Indian origin ethnic forms. Right. We should have the courage to do that. And the more Christians are able to bravely venture into that world, the greater that we are able to assimilate it and redeem it. Now, having said that, there are also particular dangers with it because a lot of our Indian art forms are deeply rooted within the Advaitic and uh, what within philosophical thinking that might be uh, dif difficult for Christians to be like Christianity to have, have compatibility with, all right, just like yoga and things like that. They, it's just that there are certain things that can be redeemed and we should. And so my answer is affirmative. We should. But let's do it with caution. Let's do that with caution. Let's do that with a sense of learning and understanding and uh, theological debates about it. What is the origins of this form? Uh, how we can assimilate it? In what way? So... As much as we have, so there are two le levels to this. There are two layers to it. One is the practical and the pragmatic. So people who are gifted in Carnatic music, people who can use their bodies in it and express that type of articulation should move into that. So that's one form. And we should have courageous people who are able to do that and creatively engage and artistically engage. Another level is the theological aspect to understand what is the history behind this movement, you know. What is the history behind this type of expression through the body? What is the theology of bodily artistic expression to glorify God? And how does that understand? How does that manifest itself in Indian history and Indian art? All right. And how we make this connection? Right. Um, I know that's a very complicated way of answering that question. Lata, do you have a counter question? Uh, is this helpful to way of looking at it? Yeah, it's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Jacob. Thank you for answering sure. that. Yeah, sure. Okay, we have another question about um, from from Mr. Sam Daniels. Uh, in brief, he has a friend or had a friend who was a very good uh, scorer. He's got really good marks and gold medalist in college, but the person has become an atheist. I'm not sure what the religion was prior, but they've become an atheist. They have read a lot of things. They have read Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata, Quran, like a lot of books religious books and they have come to the understanding that people are uh, very poor in the understanding people are not clear but they're only grabbing onto faith as a as a crutch to you know because they have a lot of fear in them and so this person has been pushing uh, mr sam daniels to be more confident and to give up on his faith so how can this interaction between them work out and how is it yeah the question from him is is it possible to bring him to christ and how to do that yeah, many of these arguments are not new, uh, what this person is asking. To use religion as a psychological crutch has been uh, uh, spoken about by thinkers and philosophers throughout. Um, a major figure is Freud. You know, Freud was the one who says that a religion is a psychological crutch for people who cannot face the difficulties of life. You know, um, And so even uh, Richard Dawkins, I think, wrote you know, that um, religion is a crutch for people who are afraid of the darkness. And then John Lennox, right, that atheism is a crutch for people who are afraid of the light. And that's how he responds to that. It 
you can you can use anything as a crutch say if an atheist is a greater crutch because for him he can do anything in this world and at the end he does not have to be answerable for it he can live an amoral life do whatever he wants and then at the end of it he's not answerable to god and he he does not have to kind of answer for his actions you know and so it it is not necessary for us to what combat him or to always answer these type of people uh, uh, people who kind of uh, are very confident about their position the way in which my example that was there jesus christ also has not been very quick to give the pharisees an answer or anybody else an answer you know it is to be able to say what he believes very strongly or it is to be able to ask a counter question to make them deeply think you know one question you can ask is don't you think that an atheism is a crutch that you want to believe because you don't want to face the reality that god could exist and your life you are answerable for your life maybe that could be a counter question that uh, uh, he could ask you. um and it's to say that yeah, but it is to say that you know the more you are confident more we are confident in our belief and live in that reality we don't have to pander to others we don't have to pander to people their faith we can pray for them uh, and they are in their own journey uh, and we can pray that god will take them and many times god takes people through a different difficult journey so that they can they can understand christ in a much more deeper way which they would not have if they had not taken this journey so maybe you can just pray for that person you know you don't have to be shaken and be calm in the way you address thank you um okay so i think we have a few questions here and i'll try to summarize that a little to a to an extent uh but the, one of the question is kind of a follow up to what you said uh, discussed earlier on about engaging with the culture being part of the culture but being you know discerning in what we accept and don't accept so there's a question on what is the right level for example some evangelists wear saffron clothes so what is the right uh, is it is it right to use that to help people connect with them because otherwise i think it's also uh, a foreign uh, concept to them how to be connected with their cultures what is the right level yeah um that's an important question um see uh, the 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 difficult part here is actually i don't know whether there are very objective answers to this question you know uh, is uh, wearing a tilak uh, they wearing a bindi okay is wearing satin thing okay is doing yoga okay? now, these are very nuanced complicated questions that i think each there are different ways an individual needs to answer firstly what is his reading of his bible and his conscience saying about engaging the culture in this way firstly all right what is our under, what is this particular person's reading of the bible and his conscience say about engaging with this culture that would be fun. secondly his or her local community you have to speak to people all right speak to your pastor speak to your uh, people around you all right get their perspective on it don't make a journey all by yourself you know I, and some people are called for that also like a radical engagement that is there all right but uh, i feel if christ has called us to a community then get that community's perspective on it be able to listen to it thirdly let your motivations always be right you shouldn't be radical for the sake of being radical or shouldn't engage just for the sake of it but if you say in your heart yes by doing this all right i am clear in my conscience with god and it will help me be a better engager okay it will help me bring this person to christ it will help me articulate the faith more here. they will listen to me if i wear this which they will not if they if i do not wear this so always test your heart test your motivations all right bring it before christ and see where that takes you you know and so this is a discussion that every christian community should have within their particular community because you know what is it like if i wear a saffron robe here in bangalore city and walk around i'll be completely irrelevant you know so so wearing that will be a hindrance to people you know they themselves don't wear it so what is my point but fair someone else you know uh, who who is uh, uh, someone else who is with a different community you know uh, engaging with either the ramakrishna mission or uh, Uh, any other group that is there you know the brahma kumari or whatever group that is there if they believe that it is an engagement that can help them translate the gospel more clearly there then 
maybe that's that's their journey. You know, that is their journey that they have to be able to. So we as Christians should be happy not having very objective pat answers to it. Because our journey of faith is never very clear cut. Is never very, this is right, this is wrong. Okay. Cultural journeys are always murky. All right. It is, it requires a step of faith. Get into it. Pray together as a community. Get into it. See what is there. And once it is a practical life rather than a theoretical life. Theories, we can make a lot of constructs. You know, we can give, okay. But you need to make that call for yourself. Make that judgment. But what I can give objectively is these three paradigms. Firstly, what does scripture say? What do you believe? How do you interpret scripture? And what does your conscience say about going in this direction? Firstly. Secondly, uh, what do it in a community. Are you speaking to others? Are you speaking to your church leaders? Are you speaking to your church about this particular endeavor? You know, Are you bringing that in your life? Thirdly, what are your motivations? What is your motivation for doing this? Thank you. Thank you so much for answering that with, uh, with the wisdom and the, and the tenderness that it needs to be, especially with people from such diverse cultures uh, in, in India. Uh, Lata ma'am, do you have any last words or do we have time for one more question? Uh, yeah, we have time, but I wanted to tell Jacob, thank you so much. It is really wonderful the way how you answered, like it is murky and... Uh, how for everything it, it, we cannot tell the objective way of answer and so tenderly and exactly in the way that uh, you're supposed to um, answer to the very difficult question. So what I was wondering in my mind is we are planning to have a panel discussion on some of the important topics, what you said about identity, sexuality and gender and the culture and um, also creation and the number of days and so on, some of the difficult topics what Christians face. So some three or four of us could be in the panel and then people can ask questions and among us on some. So this week, thought of Saturdays or Thursdays. So if you can become part of it um, and give us some dates of this. That's my thought on this. So, um, uh, no. Hey folks, uh, uh, this is David uh, from Dallas, Texas. I, I wanted to just take a minute to to acknowledge Dr. Lata and Dr. Uh, and also um, and, and also I was uh, supposed to moderate uh, this call today, but I apologize due to a few uh, work-related and personal uh, uh, situation. But it's a tremendous uh, talk and conversation uh, that you guys had, and looking forward to uh, more. As uh, Dr. Lata has pointed out, in terms of apologetics and uh, in the ever-changing world or in the em uh, ever-emerging social uh, situations uh, throughout the world here in the U.S. or also in India, so love to stay tuned and also be part of this uh, group. So my personal apologies, Dr. Lata and uh, uh, Sister Beatrice. Uh, last minute, I had to change, but uh, hopefully going forward. Uh, I'll be part of it. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Mr. Jacob, for, for all this wonderful and patient and kind, and as well as very thought-provoking uh, talk that we've had today. Uh, with that, we will end the call. But like we said, please do participate. There's a WhatsApp chat group that I've posted in the chat box. Please do join that if you're interested to learn more about DRM apologetics, including the talk that Dr. Latar just mentioned and invited uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Jacobs presence as well. And of course, let's have continue having these very important faith and light carrying conversations as we are the partners of Christ in this world. Thanks. And Monday, so so Lynette, Lynette is Monday, Lynette is speaking. So kindly join again. This is that's the second part of this. Uh, today, Jacob spoke and Monday, Lynette would be speaking. So kindly join for that too.